Imagination. 75. It is man's ruling faculty, queen of lies and error, and all the greater deceiver, for that she does not always deceive. For she would be an infallible touchstone of truth if she were a touchstone of falsehood. But being most often false, she leaves no sure mark of her quality, for she sets the same stamp upon truth and falsehood. I speak not of fools, but of the wisest of mankind, among whom imagination exhibits her greatest power of persuasion. Reason protests to no purpose. She is incompetent to appraise things. This haughty power, which loves to rule and lord it over reason, her foe, has bestowed upon man a second nature, just to show her great might. She has her fortunate followers and her unfortunate, her sound and sick, her rich, her poor. She causes reason to believe, to doubt, to deny. She dulls the senses or sharpens them. She has her fools and her sages, and nothing vexes us more than to see her fill her minions with a satisfaction greater and more complete than reason does. Men whose cleverness lies in their own imagination are far better pleased with themselves than sensible men can ever reasonably be. They look down arrogantly upon others. They argue with boldness and assurance. The sensible do so with timidity and mistrust. The sprightly air of those who imagine themselves wise often gives them an advantage in the minds of their hearers. Such favor do they find with like-minded judges. Imagination cannot make fools wise, but she makes them happy, whereas reason can only make her friends wretched. The former covers them with glory, the latter covers them with shame. Who hands out reputations? Who apportions respect and veneration to people, to achievements, to laws, to the great, if not this faculty of imagination? All the wealth of the world would be insufficient without its help. Would you not say that this magistrate, whose reverend old age makes him respected by a whole nation, is influenced by pure reason of the loftiest kind, and that he judges things as they are, ignoring trifling details which touch the imagination only of weaker men? Watch him coming to a religious service, filled with devout zeal, his sound judgment strengthened by his ardent charity. He is ready to listen with exemplary respect. But if the preacher, when he appears, turns out to be endowed with a hoarse voice and an odd sort of face, if his barber has shaved him badly, and if on top of that he looks bedraggled, I will wager that, no matter what great truths he enunciates, our magistrate's gravity will give way. The greatest philosopher in the world, standing on the brink of a precipice, on an amply wide plank, and convinced by his reason that he was perfectly safe, would be undone by his imagination. Many would be unable even to think of such a thing without breaking into a cold sweat. I have no wish to enumerate all its potentialities. We all know that the sight of cats or rats, even the fall of a piece of coal, is enough to unhinge the reason. A tone of voice affects even the wisest, and can alter the sense of a speech or a poem. Love and hate can change the face of justice. How much fairer does an advocate find his case when he has pocketed a handsome retaining fee? And how much better does the case appear to the court led astray by his confident bearing? How absurd reason can be, swayed by a breath, in every direction! I should have to register almost every act of my fellow men who have to be jogged by imagination before they begin to move. For reason has had to give way, and at her wisest she takes as her own principles which have been recklessly circulated by human imagination. Our magistrates know this secret. Their red robes, the ermine in which they wrap themselves like furry cats, the courts where they sit, the fleur-de-lis. They needed all that solemn paraphernalia, 
and physicians without their cassocks and mules, and lawyers without their square caps and gowns four times too big, would never have taken in the world which cannot resist so convincing a display. Did the former possess the justice, and physicians the true art of healing, they would not need their caps. The majesty of the sciences would be reverend enough by itself. But as their science is merely imaginary, they have to employ these childish gourds which strike the imagination they turn to account, and thereby, in fact, inspire respect. Soldiers alone do not dress up like that, because the part they play is more substantial. They establish themselves by force, not by make-believe. This is why our kings have not resorted to such disguise. They do not don fancy dress in order to appear royal. They have the accompaniment of guards and pikes, the red-faced rogues whose hands and strength are dedicated to their protection, the drums and trumpets which go before them, and the legions which stand around them, make the stoutest hearts shake with fear. They have more than the tunic. They have power. Only a very dry reason can regard as a common man the Grand Turk in his proud seraglio with forty thousand janissaries about him. The mere sight of an advocate in cap and cassock induces a high opinion of his competence. Imagination governs all. She creates beauty, justice, and happiness, which are mankind's whole aim. I should much like to see the Italian book, Della Opinione Regina del Mondo, of which I know but the title, but a title worth a whole library. Although to me unknown, I accept it, barring the evil in it, if any there be. Such are, broadly speaking, the effects of this deceitful faculty, which would seem to have been bestowed upon us expressly to lead us into inevitable error. There are many other sources of that. Old impressions are not the only ones capable of cheating us. The charms of novelty have a like power. Hence arise all the disputes between men who blame each other for following the illusions of their childhood, or else for running rashly after novelties. Who keeps the proper mean? Let him stand forth and prove it. There is no maxim, no matter how natural, even from childhood which cannot be made to pass for a false impression, whether of education or of the senses. Because, say they, you have believed since childhood that a box was empty when you see nothing in it. You have believed in the possibility of a void. Tis an illusion of the senses, strengthened by custom, which has to be corrected by science. And others say, because the school taught you that there is no such thing as a void, your common sense, which understood the matter so clearly before it got that false impression, has been corrupted, and you must correct it by going back to your original nature. Which is the culprit, the senses or education? There is another source of error, bouts of sickness. These weaken our judgment and our senses, and if the serious ones have a visible effect, I doubt not that the slight ones produce their proportionate impression. Self-interest again is a wonderful instrument for pleasantly dazzling the eye. The justest man in the world may not act as judge in his own cause. I know some who, in order to escape falling into the snare of self-love, have been contrariwise gravely unjust. The surest way of spoiling a perfectly just cause was to get it recommended to them by their near kinsmen. Justice and truth are two such subtle matters that our instruments are too clumsy to hit upon them. Even if they manage to get near them, they press all around with blunted point, and reach the false more often than the true. 